It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. As the 2020 presidential race gets underway, one of the main issues being discussed is Medicare for all. Now, Senator Kamala Harris and Senator Cory Booker and Elizabeth Warren have all announced their candidacies, and Senator Sanders is ex expected to do so very soon. They have all, of course, presented versions of Medicare for All. Weighing in recently on all of their proposals were two billionaires who also are considering a run in 2020, and that is the former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg and um, the uh, CEO of uh, Starbucks, Howard Schultz. Now, let's listen to Bloomberg uh, making an argument against Medicare for All, where he says it won't work. I think you can have Medicare for All for people that are uncovered, but because that's a smaller group and a lot of them are taking care of Medicaid already, Medicare. Uh, but uh, to replace the entire private system uh, where companies provide health care for their employees would bankrupt us for a very long time. It's just not a practical thing. Then there was Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, making a slightly different argument on The View. Well, I just want to ask quickly, what are the Dems too left on, you think? What well, issues will... Well, I, I don't things? know Senator Harris, but... Listening to her last night say we should abolish the insurance industry as a way to go forward on health care, that alone would wipe out millions of jobs of Americans. And that is a kind of extreme policy that is not a policy that I agree with. Joining me now to discuss these criticisms of Medicare for All are Bob Poland and Adam Gaffney. Bob Poland is a distinguished professor of economics and co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thanks for joining us, Bob. Great to be on. Thank you, Sharmini. And Dr. Adam Gaffney is president of Physicians for a National Program and is a preliminary and critical care physician at Harvard Medical School and the Cambridge Health Alliance. Adam, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, before we get into the issue at hand, um, we should note that Senator Sanders' health care proposal is actually somewhat different from those that Senator Kamala Harris and Senator Cory Booker have presented, and that is that Sanders' proposal would put health care completely in the public sector, while Kamala Harris and Cory Booker proposal would maintain some sort of a mixed private-public program. But uh, let's deal with Bloomberg's argument against all of this first. Let me go to you, Bob. Bloomberg says it would cost just too much and uh, thus be unpractical. What is your response to him? Well, uh, Michael Bloomberg's assertion that Medicare for all would bankrupt the country is a complete non sequitur, as a matter of fact. Um, Medicare for all will save money, will save a lot of money. Um, all we have to do is look at how other countries run their healthcare systems. Uh, if you look at the average for the advanced economies other than the United States, they're spending between nine and 11% of national income of GDP. We're spending about 18% of GDP with our private system mixed in with the public Medicare, Medicaid systems. Now, what is the difference if we spent 11% of GDP as opposed to 18% that we are spending? That's a difference of about a trillion and a half dollars. So we are basically wasting a trillion and a half dollars. That's money that's going primarily to the health, private health insurance companies and the pharmaceutical industry uh, that other countries are not spending because we have this incredibly complex, inefficient, unfair healthcare system. Medicare for all would save money. That the thrust of our study that was put out at the end of November, uh, analyzing Medicare for all for the United States, uh, by moving to a public health insurance system, uh, we think we would be able to 
provide good coverage for everybody, every resident of the country, including all people who are uninsured, all people who are underinsured, who aren't able to meet their bills, even though they have health insurance. We think we can cover everybody. And on top of that, we can save about 10% relative to the $3.3 trillion we are now spending in the United States on health care. All right, uh, Adam, let me also ask you that question. Now, Bloomberg says it would cost too much and, and therefore be unpractical. What's your response to that? Well, there's a couple ways to look at this. I mean, first, I would echo what Professor Pollan said about the comparison between the United States and other high-income nations that spend a lot less in healthcare than we do. But another way to look at this is what would it actually cost? And um, and and why would he even say that it would cost more? Now, the thing is, is we agree that we want to cover everyone in this country, and we agree, or most of us agree, that people are getting a bad deal as things are currently, high co-payments, high deductibles, high premiums. So we agree that we want to cover everyone and improve coverage for everybody else. If that's the goal, Medicare for all is unquestionably the most efficient way to get there. If we can't afford universal health care by way of Medicare for all, then we can't afford it at all. Now we can afford it, okay? But we can afford it because Medicare for all produces a number of key efficiencies. Um, first and foremost, um, and this is in Professor Pollan's um, report, um, is the great uh, administrative waste that the private health insurance imposes on the, on, on the whole healthcare system. Um, hospitals have to basically have armies of billers and coders to go through every chart. Um, this is an enormous amount of money uh, my colleagues, you know, estimated that um, going to a complete Canadian-style healthcare system would save $500 billion a year in administrative savings. Professor Pollan also has very high, significant savings in his report. Um, and then let's look at pharmaceutical companies and pharmaceutical firms. How much could we save on that end? Well, we spend about twice as much um, on drugs. Our drug prices are about twice of what they are in other high-income nations. So let's say we were to have a national health insurance program and bring those down by 50%, you're talking about you know another more than $100 billion a year in savings. So yes, there will be new costs to cover everybody. Um, there will be costs to eliminate co-payments and deductibles and to make sure that not one person in this country is, un is uninsured. Um, but there's huge savings on the other side of the ledger. And the problem with people like um, Schultz and Bloomberg is they're not actually aware of the issues and they don't actually know what's on the other side of the ledger. All right. Uh, Bob, let me ask you this question. Now that uh, uh, Kamala Harris and Cory Booker uh, and others are declaring their candidacy and they are trying to come somewhere down the middle, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, is it worth uh, perhaps considering that in order to get more buy-in from, say, corporate Democrats? Well, there's a lot of problems, but the most basic one, since we're talking about costs, is that you will not get the cost savings that I talked about and that Adam just talked about. Um, there was actually a study by the Congressional Budget Office recently that looked at the potential for cost savings through incorporating um, a so-called public option so that we would maintain the existing private health insurance system, but there would also be a public system like Medicare that would be available to people if they chose it. And uh, their study found that, that you could get over 10 years about $160 billion in savings. Now that sounds like a big number, but if you divided it by 10, that's $16 billion a year. Whereas according to our study, uh, we think we can get $300 billion a year in savings relative to our existing system, even while everyone is well covered. And I would just then reiterate and emphasize again uh, what Dr. Gaffney just said, where do we get the big, the biggest source of savings is the massive sim simplification of the administrative system. And the second one is through uh, dramatically cutting pharmaceutical prices so that they come more in line with other uh, advanced economies. 
All right. Now, let's uh, shift over to the issue of jobs and the jobs that will be lost, according to Schultz. Now, um, I'll go to Adam here first. Now, Adam, the concern which we saw Howard Schultz articulate in the introduction clip we ran, uh, that millions of health insurance jobs would be lost if M Medicare for all would be implemented the way we are talking about it. Now, um, I guess coming from him being the CEO of um, uh, Starbucks, who's providing insurance, who's known for providing insurance for all its workers, including the part-time workers, um, I guess this, we have to take this very seriously. What do you make of what he's saying? Well, I think it is a real issue. Um, you know, unlike the concern about the overall system costs, um, ensuring that there is a just transition from the existing system to um, the Medicare for All system does require a just transition of taking care of workers who um, are displaced. Um, so yes, there are there are enormous there are many workers um, in in the private health insurance industry. Um, as well as who are doing billing and coding activities that do add nothing to the system that just take money out that are going to not have their current jobs eventually once the system's in place. So how do we deal with that? Well, it actually is a way to deal with it. It's contained in both bills in Congress. Um, the Sanders bill, since we're talking about that, has a just transition, um, money set aside, significant money to help with retraining, to help with salary support for those workers. Um, let's also not forget that there's going to be a lot of new jobs that will have to be created as part of this transition. Um, there's going to be some new care that's going to be need to be need to be provided, some new caretakers. Um, and so I think there's going to be no shortage of new employment opportunities. But obviously, people will need retraining and other sorts of um, help to, to move from one, one part of the healthcare sector to another. Um, but, you know, I don't really take that as a serious critique. Many um, billionaires are very happy when jobs get, you know, pushed around, when jobs go overseas. Um, it's only when um, we're talking about um, moving to a fully universal healthcare system um, that they're suddenly so concerned about uh, transitions um, of that nature. All right, Bob, I'll go to you. How do we um, address this issue of job loss in the insurance sector? Uh, thanks, Sharmini. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the study that we put out last November is the first one that actually takes a serious look at this. And we did take a very serious look at it. It's a full chapter in our study. Uh, we go into uh, great depth. It's comparable to the work we've done in other areas of the economy on just transition, as Adam just referred to. And Howard Schultz is right. Uh, you know, we estimate that there will be a contraction in jobs on the order of a total of a million. So he says millions, it's closer to probably a million. Um, and these are the jobs that, uh, that Adam just talked about. So the workers in the currently employed in the private health insurance industry, and a, a good share of the people that are in the provider's offices, like doctor's offices, doing the administrative jobs. So we definitely have to commit to a just transition for all of them. And, and as Adam said, in uh, the Sanders bill, there is a reference to it. I wouldn't say that they emphasize it. I think that they need to give it much more attention, but I, I do find having done a pretty careful analysis on this, that the amount of money that is uh, that's proposed in the Sanders bill is pretty much on target. It's a pretty good number relative to what is needed. So we estimated that if you look at uh, the, the things that are needed, uh, that are, is um, to protect the pension funds of the people who would be moving out of the insurance industry jobs, uh, to uh, retrain relocate uh, and give uh, what wage insurance. So if you move from the health insurance job to another job where the pay is lower, uh, you get support. Uh, we're looking at something like uh, $60 billion over the course of a two-year transition. So $120 billion uh, for two years. And that is about 2% uh, per year of the overall costs of the health uh, healthcare system uh, under Medicare for All. The way we actually designed uh, the whole healthcare, the single payer system, 
we incorporated a 1% surplus in the revenues that would be coming in to finance the system. So we've already got 1% of the 2% needed through the financing. So we would have to have a one-year additional surplus of revenue, one year, 1%. One uh, and that way, I think we can get everybody in the system who will be displaced into another kind of uh, decent situation. All right, um, Adam, um, if the number crunching, uh, you know, obviously points to the cost efficiency, then it seems to be a question of uh, political buy-in. So leading up to the 2020 elections, the uh, the campaigns, as well as, you know, our new Congress, uh, uh, young Congress we have, all have to be infused with the politics of how to sell this public health care system. Um, what can be done in order for us to ha be having that more reasonable conversation when it comes to the 2020 campaign? Well, I think I'd first point out that we already have made a great deal of progress in this regard. I mean, if you look at where we've come over the last few years in terms of the discussion on health care, single payer health care has swung from more or less the margins of the discussion to the center of the discussion. So we've come a long way. And I think that is a very telling point because it suggests, it, it, it begs the question why. Um, and I think overall what you see is that politicians follow the people. Politicians follow the grassroots. There has been a push from the bottom up for Medicare for All that has been underway for a long time and is now um, uh, producing results. Um, you know, there's already been a lot of success in both houses of Congress. Sanders had a single payer bill for many years that people didn't know about really, or many people didn't. Um, it was only in 2017 that he got 16 co-sponsors. Um, and it wasn't because you know, there was a new, it was all new senators in, in, in Congress. It was because the existing senators realized that this is where the, the people were moving. Um, and similarly, we've seen in the last few years that um, the House single payer bill attracted, you know, a majority of House Democrats and a new um, bill is coming out soon, as I'm, as I'm sure you've heard. So, you know, what does this mean? It means um, we have to continue pushing candidates. We have to hold their feet to the fire. We have to, those of us in sort of the policy community, have to continue to provide the best quality evidence, push the soundest science, um, and not let a lot of the corporate talking heads steal all, the, all, all of the air in the room. Um, but the reality is, is that there is going to be enormous opposition, and we can sugarcoat it all we want, but the corporate opposition is going to be massive. Um, there's a new organization out there that's taking money from the pharmaceutical companies and the insurers called Partnership for America's Healthcare Future that's already plunging into this debate. Um, you know, it's going to be taking out ads, and we're going to be seeing this more and more. So it's going to be a huge amount of misleading information that is going to be poured into sort of the American media space, um, and it is going to confuse people. So those of us um, on the policy side, those of us on the political side, are going to really have our work cut out for us to get out there and to dispel the myths that are going to be, um, you know, jumping up every day. Like it's going to be a whack-a-mole kind of scenario. Um, so we need the kind of science, but we also need um, the politics and the, and the grassroots activism that's, that's getting these messages out there. All right, Bob, um, in 2008, 2009, during the Obama's first presidential campaign, we were having the same conversation. Yes, it has moved forward now. We have the Cory Bookers and Kamala Harris's coming forward and saying yes uh, to Medicare for all. But, you know, they're proposing this, please, everybody out there, the, the corporate Democrats as well as the, uh, as the progressives. Um, so what is your take on the political uh, pushback that Adam is uh, talking about in terms of the corporate sector? Um, and, and how do the progressives fight this? As I said at the beginning, you know, the fact that we run a healthcare system at 18% of national income, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to other advanced economies at 9 to 11%, we are looking at a difference of a trillion and a half dollars and that trillion and a half dollars is money funneled into the uh, health insurance industry primarily and the pharmaceutical industry. So you can be sure that they are going to be fighting till the bitter end and use every tactic available to them 
in order to defeat Medicare for all or anything like it. Uh, the kinds of compromises that have occurred over time with respect to uh, the demands of the people for a decent health care system versus uh, the corporate interests uh, that want to keep making a trillion dollars a year or thereabouts um, have led, the types of compromises that have occurred have led to the ongoing situation we have now, which is the health insurance, the health uh, care costs of the economy keep going up and they keep going up because it's a way to buy off the health insurance industry, the pharmaceutical industry, some of the providers and hospitals, um, and uh, at least attempt to expand coverage. What we have got now is that we still have, even with Obamacare, we have you know, 27 million people who are uncovered and another 30 to 40 million people who have are, are underinsured. And so there is no solution within the framework that uh, under which we operate now, a framework dominated by private profits. So what is the answer? Well, uh, the only answer is to keep fighting for a good system, Medicare for all, and be, be as effective as possible. And I think we have to give Bernie Sanders a lot of credit here. Uh, he's, one, he's the one that put this into the mainstream of political discourse in the country. Kamala Harris didn't, Cory Booker certainly didn't. Uh, Jerry Brown in, in California, when there is a serious chance of getting something passed in, in California a year ago, he opposed it. You know, he's supposed to be a liberal Democrat. So uh, we really have to mobilize and the, the, what, as Adam said, the types of people that have to be engaged are, you know, everybody who cares about a decent healthcare system. The fact that Adam is president of a very important organization of physicians in favor of a single payer health care system. They play an important role. The National Nurses Union play an important role. Uh, those people are coming together with the, the people that they are serving us uh, to say that we want to fight for a decent health care system. I never thought we would break through as far as we had so quickly. Uh, but as you know, I was involved in the uh, California fight and it passed the state Senate uh, in um, May 2017. It passed overwhelmingly. That's California. It's the biggest state in the country. So we are making progress. And, and, and that was connected to the Sanders campaign, uh, which put this on the agenda, the mainstream agenda. All right, Adam, I'm going to give you the final word. Is there any polling out there um, where the, the public support for Medicare for all uh, of the kind that we are talking about here would convince uh, some of the candidates that are running that it is in their favor to support this because there's uh, public support for it? Well, I think that's what precisely what happened. Um, you know, Kaiser Family Foundation polls showed 40% support for Medicare for all in the late 90s, and they now show above 50% support. There was a Reuters poll last year that actually showed a historic 70% support among the public uh, for Medicare for all. So there's no question that the amount of, a, of support that Medicare for all has had from many, many candidates um, that, that, that you've mentioned um, reflects the growing tide of discontent, with the healthcare status quo, and the growing embrace of Medicare for all um, um, among the public. Now, people will push back and say those polls are malleable. When you tell people X, Y, or Z, they often are less inclined. Um, but you know what? If you were to also tell people, well, yes, that's true. Your, your taxes would go up somewhat, but you'd also have no premiums, no copays, no deductibles, no networks, no insurer denials. Um, then the support would go up further. So the overall gist is that the public supports Medicare for all with a clear majority. Um, but our work is to really help people to understand what this means what it would do for them, and why we really need all of us to be um, all in and um, and have no one out. And that's the work that's cut out for us as we move ahead. And that was Adam Gaffney, president of Physicians for a National Program. Thanks for joining us, Adam. Thank you for having me. And also joining us was Bob Poland, professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thanks for joining us, Bob. Thanks again for having me on, Charmaine.
And thank you all for joining us here on The Real News Network.